Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Ehan Isaacs. I'm the head of global growth uh, for the Founder Institute. Super excited to bring you today's webinar. Uh, we're just about to get started here. I can see, okay, we have about 24 people online right now. We had close to uh, 225 sign up. So uh, I'm expecting close to the 80 to maybe 100 mark. And I know a lot of people are going to be listening to the recording. Um, super excited uh, to have our amazing panel today on um, how large organizations can actually build a successful venture building program. We have two amazing guests with us today. Let me just pull up their bios. But uh, today we have Tatiana Lemos, who's uh, the partner at 10X Growth. She brings over close to 30 years of experience in marketing and, and innovation. So super glad that she's here. Um, she's worked with global brands like Nestle and Unilever to launch new ventures. And she she's going to be representing more of the client side uh, uh, today and giving her perspective of being with the large corporate for so many years. And she's obviously advised large organizations on how to build and launch their own startup accelerator. So, uh, Tatiana, uh, welcome to, I guess, this panel event to this global audience who will be listening to you. Thank you so much. And hi, guys. Awesome. Let me just introduce Misha as well. So Misha, if you were on the panel uh, two, three weeks ago, he was on board uh, giving another presentation on corporate venture building. But Misha is also the founder of 10X Growth, a boutique agency that works with large organizations to simplify their venture building process with its battle tested methodology. He spent the last 15 years helping international organizations like Nestle, Unilever and Philips innovate systematically at scale. So Misha, thank you so much for being here once again. Super good, man. Very welcome. Awesome. So we have our audience is still picking up right now. We have people coming in from Cincinnati, Cologne, uh, Antwerp, Toronto, Bali. So uh, Bengaluru, India, Kentucky, Berlin, Palestine. So you have an international audience with you today. Um, okay. well, you know, let's kind of get things started. Uh, I have a bunch of questions prepared, but, you know, folks, there's a Q&A button. I'm going to submit my questions there. Uh, but if you folks have a different question, please add it. You can upvote my questions. You can upvote other people's questions. I'm just going to take them as we come. We have about 40 minutes, and then after that, we'll break out for networking. Um, all right, so this let's kind of get things started. I guess while I add the questions to the chat, uh, Tatiana or Misha, do you want to explain how, like a little bit more about yourself and like how the two how the two of you met, and then we can go to the the good juicy questions while why we're here. Tatiana, you may start. Okay, okay. Our our story, Misha. No, I've been I've been around in the corporate world for a good while, as I am just uh, shared with you. And my last uh, stretch uh, within the corporate world with Nestle was actually uh, heading marketing for their innovation accelerator, which is actually a part of R and D. And uh, there, the methodology we used uh, was outsourced to Misha's agency at that time. And uh, I then uh, had the privilege of uh, being in one uh, innovation group end-to-end -to, -end to really, really understand how it works and how we do it in six months from lab to shop, end-to-end. Um, it was like an MBA for me. Coming from traditional marketing strategy, it was really a, a wonderful new way, leaner, faster, um, um, more, more intelligent, simply, uh, to, do, to do marketing, to do commercial. So um, I was super convinced that that was the way to go. And after a while, um, I decided to leave. Uh, Misha left, too, and we teamed up uh, to really do what we love to do but in a way that would be even better than what we had experienced before. So we joined our, our insights, our experiences, and our ambition to do better, and we created 10X. So that's, that's our story together. Yeah. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't have a lot uh, to add to that story because, uh, yeah, I completely agree. That's how it went. And um, I think there are, and that's probably also part of the panel discussion, right? I mean, it's just... Uh, First of all, I think it's necessary to to face the reality that corporate venture building is a complex thing, eh? um, and I see a tendency now, which is already one of the questions. I know you will start asking a bit later, but there's a tendency that um, uh, that venture building might be the new solution for certain problems, um, but still, um, it's not a, a quick uh, fix. You know, it's not a, a recipe. 
and it requires uh, a lot of things to be in place to ensure a certain return on investment because there are studies um, that actually have proven that a corporate venture building life cycle, which is not a very new term, eh? this is already started in 1960s with skunk works, you know, and all that stuff. So a lot of research has done that the corporate life cycle, venture building cycle, if that uh, is a good term, sort of has three years in, in year one, People are enthusiastic. You start, you do programs. Year two, uh, you start perfecting. You learn. If you are good, you start learning, reflect, what can we do? And in year three, people ask, when are we going to make money? Uh, and that is basically, then you also see the closure of, uh, we had PepsiCo labs in the past. Disney opened their lab, then they closed it again. So it's quite a, a complex topic. And I hope we can dive a bit more deeper today in, and what are the, the mechanisms right behind uh, the things that why it makes it complex and also how we can intervene and how can we, you know, uh, become more effective in this uh, venture building uh, domain. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So I guess let's kick things off. So everyone, I've added my questions into the Q&A button. I have see some people already uploading it. So I'm just going to go as we come across. The, one of the reasons I like this platform is because I can do this and bring up the question. Uh, so it's easier for everyone to kind of in the audience see. So again, the format for this is Misha is going to represent more of the agency mindset and approaching this as an external vendor. And hopefully, Tatiana, you can bring in the internal, like how would a corporation bring uh, think about this? But uh, as of now, what are some of the biggest challenges you face in driving innovation within a corporation? And how have you overcome them? So maybe Misha, you can talk about yeah. the perspective of when yeah. you when you enter maybe on the client side, and then Tatiana yeah. like, on the receiving side, like dealing with all your best friends at work and driving change. Yeah. <laughs> no, sure, I can I can uh, kick it off, and then Tatiana, you fill in, uh, of course. So uh, biggest challenges. So um, now I think a couple. So most challenges from an outside perspective are on a tactical level, meaning um, very practical stuff sometimes. Like, so we do fast learning, right? So we want to de-risk our assumptions in all different types of innovation ideas that we have. And so it's of course lean startup and, and, and all types of validation tools that you want to apply. Um, but you notice that a corporation is not uh, designed um, to enable fast learning. Eh? It's designed to reduce risk for obvious reasons. Eh? So it's designed to protect the core business with a legal perspective, with an HR perspective, etc. cetera. Um, so then uh, we are coming in with a, with a small team, a small ninja team, right? And we're going to do X amount of experiments very fast with all different types of tools. We're going to gather data from consumers and then suddenly legal comes, of course, like, hey, um, what are you doing with the data? Then IT comes in, hey, is this Insta page tool or whatever you might use, is this compliant, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one, but that's more a practical thing which you can solve with the people. And my advice is they take these people serious and take them into the journey so they understand what you're actually trying to do. Um, and then another thing is, what I think is the biggest thing is mindset. Yeah, so there's a lot of emphasis in the whole venture building world, including my myself. Yeah, so I wrote a book, 10X Growth Machine, which is really focusing on a couple of hard pillars from processes to metrics, how to fund innovations, how to stop innovations, etc. cetera. Um, but um, uh, I think mindset is one of the biggest things because how do you deal with the uncertainty? How do you know fully when to invest in a certain venture um, and I think that whole mindset uh, is really uh, an important challenge, uh, let's say, to work on and to put more emphasis on. Um, you know, so that's that's briefly from my side. There are many more things, or but I pick a couple of big ones that I see happening a lot. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, Maybe on the on the yeah clients yes. receive if you hire someone like Misha, like what are some of the challenges? So we, Misha yeah. mentioned compliance and mindset is essentially what I heard, but we would love yeah. to get your thoughts. So imagine that you have um, a true sub-organization within your organization, right? This team is tasked with bringing innovation to the mothership. Um, 
but it needs to be super well connected to the mothership and alignment must be there from the very beginning, clarity on the brief, um, stakeholders uh, on the same page. If that is not guaranteed up front, then you can be sure nothing is going to happen at the end. And if there was something of a frustration, Misha, that brought uh, Misha and I together, was exactly this, that wonderful things can be devised and developed until the point of uh, investment merit. But then if you don't have all these different pieces of this hugely complex uh, organization uh, aligned, then nothing happens. Your, your, your chance of actually seeing the light of the day, of going commercial big time, not only uh, pilot uh, level, is, is close to zero. Because all these elements will be fighting each other, trying to bring it down, because it's not really aligned with the corporate's real, like absolutely uh, real priority, which is to drive its core business. Corporation is made to optimize uh, the way it reduces costs and increase the volumes it can make through its core businesses. So innovation is always a kind of a counter cell within a larger uh, entity, a larger uh, organism, not even organization, an organism. So um, the fact that you're there, as Misha said, lean, um, a small team, trying to do everything on its own is very counterintuitive to a large organization. Um, we try to move at a certain pace by bringing all these uh, pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, we find ourselves in, in situations where we are pointing out strategic flaws in alignment between operations and global brands, for instance. And then it needs to be resolved because otherwise we will not, as a small unpolitical uh, agnostic team will not be able to do our thing and to deliver innovation. So there are lots of, of um, um, noise and, and, and lacks of, of adjustment in the, in the bigger organization that become our own bottlenecks. So we need to resolve them to move on. So alignment is a huge thing. I don't know how much I can emphasize that. Clarity on the brief from the very beginning bringing your stakeholders together from all these parts, um, operations, brands, um, uh, country level, the guys who are going to deploy that first off, R&D, everyone must be on the same page and then be able to learn this new way of doing things and support the team through this period of time, right? So this is to me really, really huge. Yeah, so let, let me, sorry, I just want a quick follow up and maybe Misha, you can, like, if we talk about alignment, but, you know, you've set up the innovation mandate and the innovation agenda. You've hired an external vendor. And you're telling me, like, again, I'm, like, looking at this from a very, like, let's yes. say, amateur yeah. perspective, if you will. You've done all this and there's still, like, misalignment after all that. Like, A hundred percent. Let me tell you uh, where, for instance, very, very simply. And we're talking but, real innovation here. We're talking about starting with jobs to be done. Right. So we're talking basically out one common goal to which everyone in the organization can agree. We want to grow. And we think so we're going to do it through innovation. These guys can do it. Now, when we start scoping it with uh, consumer centrism, real consumer centrism, uh, jobs to be done, we find different uh, solutions that can spawn product to product and service to new business models. Models, um, we might find, for instance, uh, something that falls right in between two different established categories, right? It is not solid, it is not liquid, it is something in between. It's a combination, or to which category does it belong? And therefore, from a governance point of view internally, who's going to be the sponsor suddenly? If, if the one who briefed was the solid, I'm giving ridiculous names to it, it's not solid or liquid, but the one who, who, who burst the brief was solid, but suddenly the consumer is saying, I want it to be liquid. Now, what do we do? Is this an invalid pro project because of that? Or, or do we have to be supple enough and, and fast enough to say, hey, this is the growth opportunity. doesn't matter if solid or liquid or let's just get this game uh, back on track fast because this is a real consumer-led opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amisha, I need yeah. to help I, let's say uh, I think people are waking up when it's happening. And so uh, 
And well, I think that's, that's in general. Perspective, I can imagine. Like, yeah, so sure. it's, it's like, who are you? Yeah. I'm the guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy to fix it. And it's like, I don't know. No, but it, it's like, no, but see, I mean, I mean, the, if you read most of the strategy plans, and I've been in quite some management sessions in my life now, you read not very different things. You want to be more consumer centric, faster decision making process, empower your people. Uh, that they make decisions themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So there are not very big differences between these corporations uh, on this side of the strategy, right? Um, but uh, when we start actually making decisions without them, that's when people are getting away. It's like, okay, yeah, so you want to empower the team on the ground to follow the consumer data um, and, and, and we help them to start making decisions around the data, the consumer data. And then suddenly the, the management team is presented with these facts that the team has made a lot of decisions themselves. Now, yeah, and some people take it very well, but other people then only at that moment, the consequence of a different way of working is becoming real. Before that is theory, because these people with all respect have also so many things on their agenda, which I can understand, right? So, and therefore really let it sink in what does it mean to work consumer centric? What does it mean to work agile? What does it mean to empower a team to make decisions? Because the consequence will, will open up a shadow side in the organization that has not uh, been dealt with. And that's why most uh, transformation and change programs and venture building initiatives just don't work because they never reflected on the uh, side of innovation that then suddenly starts to enter because i mean I, I have i have seen this a lot of times is that people joined venture building programs they were completely enthusiastic because we we of course we open up their mind in the way that you can mm -hmm. learn super fast there's a new mind skill and tool set right i don't have to explain it to you i am um, but then they come back to the corporation and they're a bit stuck in the machinery again and that tends sometimes that people leave the company. So I think it's very important for the management to, uh, to reflect on this. So, so what, what does it mean for me as a leader uh, if I truly want to push this forward? What does this mean for my own behavior, right? What does it mean, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a fundamental thing. And the last build um, is that what Tatjana said, and, and Steve Blank uses these words. Right? It's like search versus execute. So large companies have a great tool set uh, with MBAs and smart people to run their business efficient, right, at scale. But there, there's a lack of a mind skill and tool set on how to search for new business, how to deal with the uncertainty, um, how to navigate through the fog, how to make investment decisions based on, on data by a young team, right? So, I mean, this is the search versus execute paradigm. That's, that's where you see the tensions, basically. And I, I think just to complement that part of internal alignment, um, it is it is not um, it's not easy for 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 these guys who have not not done it before to really embrace such uh, like a knife on your neck. Uh, we 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 run sprints, weekly sprints. Things really happen fast, and decisions have to be fast too. They're not used to, to, to be a bit more risk takers with this level of, of information and speed at the same time. At the same time, it's our belief, having seen it working in different ways through um, external processes that are completely third party um, M&As, we believe that in the long term, doing it like we do, meaning uh, working with hybrid teams where you have the client dedicated to that for a certain number of days. We are dedicated to that. And there is management supporting and involved at a certain frequency. This is the way to make it actually have greater chances of, of happening and of changing the culture of the organization over time because you're actually recycling their people's mindset. It would be um, um, erroneously uh, easier to believe that no, push it aside and, and then they can do it and they can bring it back. But trust us, this is actually harder and there's no benefits to the culture of the organization. No. Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, I want to do a quick time check. We're 20 minutes in and we've only done one question. We have like seven that's popped in. So I think we'll only be able to do a few. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And we have some audience questions. So I'm going to bring them up as well uh, as we come across. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think we'll go till the end of the hour just to make sure that we can get through as much of these as we can. So uh, I like this question from Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Nice to... Uh, as we, Deborah and I spoke a couple of days ago because she enrolled in one of our boot camps. But Deborah from Chicago is asking... Uh, you know, let's talk about the entrepreneur or executive in residence role within an innovation lab. What are top three corporations are looking for in their EIRs? I guess let's take a step back. Do you think that this is a successful model, the EIR model? Um, yeah, it depends a bit. So there's so many models, right? And, and different ways to execute what I think is is is, is of key essence. Is, it can work, but then it depends on the quality of the entrepreneur residence, its personality and track record, right? So... Um, but how I see the entrepreneur in residence model, how I have seen it, let's say, is that you get somebody from the outside, like an entrepreneur, uh, that really drives uh, a venture to a certain point. Um, and I think that depending on the type of innovation, when it's like, because also there, huh, venture building is a broad term, innovation is a broad term. So uh, we need to be specific in what do we mean with what do we say because there is well misalignment on the lore continuously but if it's horizon three type of venture building so can we spin out new ventures that are separate that are farther away from the core business then an entrepreneur in residence model might be the most logical reason because you're gonna separate it um, from your existing mothership you have a seasoned person to drive the team I think you need to be very clear about till what point uh, does that person need to bring it because you have entrepreneurs in residence that are very experienced in zero to one. You have an, uh, very experienced people moving from 10 to 100 and each phase in your venture cycle or company cycle moving from idea to something big has different challenges and nobody is, is uh, a superman or a superwoman. So we need to be alert on what does it require exactly in each phase, what we need. And there I see in reality that um, yeah, also very experienced and smart people, of course, do not have all the capacities to go from zero to thousand. And so I think that is one of the key things to look at. Can I ask, and maybe Tatiana, you can add to that. If an EIR comes on board, what are the, is the resources up to the EIR, like they're the individual contributor? Or should the organization be giving them like, hey, here's a designer, here's a developer, or should they just like go and figure it out? I think that's probably where I see some of the model sometimes breaking. It's like we some some people just want an EIR because to say that they have an EIR, okay, we have an EIR, we're good, but like they have no resources and maybe that person is just doing office hours like once a quarter. Yeah. Or something. No, so, no, I think. I, I was thinking about that. I, I think the the way it can really work, in my experience, is when you get an entrepreneur that is relatively young, that is on its first business, and therefore not very formatted to this is the way I do things. I've learned it myself. This, is, you know, a, a very some somehow uh, not only executives are very stiff in their manners, but if you're you're born and raised an entrepreneur. You have your own ways and, and you're very unflexible about, about some of them. So the easiest fit is a very young entrepreneur that leaves college with a great idea, has become an accolade or something like that, and then meets a corporation that has some infrastructure to, to offer them so that they can significantly develop that seed idea. Yeah, at that level, so to, to, to Misha's point about which kind of personality at which, at which point of the, of the, the development of, of, of the business, I think younger entrepreneurs, seed level, um, and, and a corporation that really uh, means what it says by offering infrastructure, more than money, more than a, a seat, a desk, real functions, uh, um, real, real and conditions. A sponsor, a eh? vested sponsor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that helps the, the person coach it internally, etc. Otherwise, it can be quite awkward. Uh, can be like like an alien, you know. You, you wouldn't like if if you, if you can barely find the fit. If if there is no no reason, uh, it will be expelled like uh, like an invasive 
uh, organism. It will be yeah. yeah, no, it's a, it's a valid point. Uh, okay, let's just move on. I think just to build on that, uh, Alice is asking, uh, you know, what's the best way to do corporate innovation uh, through existing or internal teams versus an open platform slash set a new team? And how would you compare some of these different models? And I think maybe Tatiana, let's start with you because you would be on the client side and hopefully you're the one who says, like, hey, we need to do innovation. Here's our innovation agenda. Uh, but like, what's the thinking you would go about deciding whether it's an open or closed model or should I do a venture building one or whichever, right? Oh, yeah. As I, as I queued, um, I really believe in the uh, dedicated internal but open acceleration model. So it belongs to the company. The company invests in it. It has real open doors to the outside world. Um, it keeps a very close connection to the mothership allowing it to have a very good degree of freedom and independence too. And, and it walks the talk by giving this kind of entity uh, a full platform to operate from, pilot plans, like whatever, you name it, dedicated people from functions, uh, money. So, so it's, it's the best way because um, it tries to live on this, on this border between independence and commitment. So if management is committed, finally, if we can do that alignment we discussed in the beginning, then there is promise in the continuation of that, which is what we all want, right? No one is into this, uh, agencies, clients, or entrepreneurs, no one is into this just to have a nice ride in six months or whatever, prove that there is merit for investment, and then yeah, I take my notes, my grades, and I go on to, to something else. No, like you want to, you're really invested. You want to see it happening. And I think, therefore, this is the best model, the hybrid model, the committed and independent model. Yeah, I think that was a great response. Misha, anything to add to that? Or uh, There are two ways to, to look at this question. Eh? So first is how to organize. That's, that's what Tatjana elaborated on. And then you also have the buy-build partner decision in your program. So... You have internal hybrid teams. We have people from the client together with us and a couple of specialists, uh, and we figure out consumer problems. And then the question becomes, do we need to build this ourselves or are we going to partner? So basically, you need to integrate your buy-build partner decision in your innovation process. So that's another way to read the question. Uh, but I hope we gave now two answers to that question. Um, yeah, I think that very, very interesting. You're getting me to think a lot as well. All right, I want to ask this question and then we'll, we'll go back to an audience question because I think this is very relevant based on where we're at in today with AI and everything. But like there's so many new technologies and tools emerging all the time. Like how do you determine which ones are actually worth investing and what criteria would you use to evaluate it? Like I can imagine there's so many people right now in a boardroom saying, hey guys, what's our AI strategy? Hey guys, what are we doing about this? And like, I guess the question is, because these are new technologies, like is it even worth like, doing anything around them or like should we is it worth them just putting it on a shelf and like seeing how it goes then go about it like you know i'd be curious on both your side like do you even bring up any of these relevant and new technologies up front or, or like yeah i'll, I'll let uh, you i, I feel uh, i would like to start this one uh, because i always have a, a strong uh, idea about this type of so and uh, technologies and tools are so also this one you can tackle from different angles right so um, of course, I think you need to experiment. Huh? You need to understand chat GTP, all different types of tools, what's happening, how can we use it, etc. I think the starting point, what is our AI strategy, is not the right starting point. It should be about customer and problem, right? So what is actually the problem that we're going to solve? And then can AI or blockchain or metaverse or whatever technology is relevant, how can that fulfill that customer job in a fantastic differentiating way? The problem is if you start with the technology, which we also have seen, is that there, in a subtle way, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy to prove that the technology is relevant. But I think that's that's the wrong way to, to, to tackle the problem. It's you start with customer and problem, and then you need to understand, well, what can these tools or technologies deliver in clear consumer benefits, no vague uh, and long, uh, fluffy uh, statements, but what can it now really solve for that customer? And that should be, in my opinion, the chronological order, how you would tackle it. Yeah, just briefly, we look at it as optimization, 
So uh, if we can delegate more and more of our campaigns and our variations in campaigns to AI technologies, uh, then we're going to do it because it shortens the time. And as I said, we work in sprints. Every week is a sprint. It's tremendously uh, high pressure. So any time we can get back is, is very much used more strategically to help us drive the right questions. And then the execution we are ready to delegate uh, as much as we can to how AI can help us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so. Yeah, it's to, to become more efficient, no brainer. Um, but um, what I also see when you look at venture building, man, there are so many, get the basics right. Yeah. So get your consumer insights right. Yeah. Go deep. Yeah? Don't have fluffy, superficial insights that we cannot build a new business around, but I mean, it's for, for me, it's first around the basic. Have talented people, get your consumer's insight right, make sure your R&D capability is, is up to speed so that it can actually produce something. Uh, and and then, uh, then, of course, we can look at uh, uh, technologies and different things. Um, but the technology in itself will not bring the miracle. And I think that's, that's important to realize. Yeah, I think another way to look at it is like don't like it's 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 a kind of founder syndrome as well. People kind of see a product and they're like, they're always thinking more product centric rather than customer problem centric. So they're yeah. they're kind of putting um, the product before the problem, right? They're like, hey, we have this product, let's go find the market for it. Is the company? Yeah, let's, find the, let's find the problem uh, to re-engineer it. And sometimes right. that can work, uh, and sometimes that can work, but uh, most of the times it is a bit of. Uh, tunnel that moves towards to prove a narrative uh, for the relevance of the technology. Yeah. Okay. Very, very relevant. Very good response. All right. I'm going to, there's a, was a really good one. Uh, I hope we can answer it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was on, how do you measure? Oh, here it is. Uh, so Pavlin is asking, I guess, you know, how do you measure all of the stuff that you guys are doing? Like, how do you make sure that you set the right metrics and it's moving in the right direction? And like, I'll add to this, if it's not moving in the right direction, do you just pull the plug and say, okay, here's your last paycheck and go? Or like, is, is there that opportunity for learning? So maybe Tatiana, we can start with you uh, because you're yes. the one who built these programs. <laughs> and yes. that'd be a good thing to, to get your I'll, perspective. I'll go about the one metric I'm very passionate about, and Misha will understand that. He knows that pretty well already. I'm almost obsessed about it. And it's at the beginning, right? Shit in, shit out. If you're not pristine about what you're doing and doing it right, right at the beginning, if you're not super consumer-centric, you're not getting your insights right, you don't develop your hypothesis right with career interviews, and then you go online to go for a more quantitative um, justification of that, then nothing else happens. Because believe me, through the hurdles that come after that stage, uh, everything will be diminished, crushed, and then there is a drop uh, at the very end of the funnel. So I am passionate about um, engagement metrics when it comes to the discovery phase, the five, uh, six initial weeks or, or even more if you have a, 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 pro, a problem, a project that is very complex, but you've got to get to the bottom of it. And, and the proof is in the pudding. Your engagement uh, um, uh, measures will tell you if you're onto something or not. And here I say, be ruthless about your, your KPIs. Um, uh, Click-through rates, uh, conversion rates, take the upper measure not don't be modest in the beginning because again it's going to be crushed so engagement metrics and i think what is um what i think is important it's actually the tool that we shared with you Ayal, and it's the investment maturity level so you have an end-to-end -end innovation process with and, and the team needs to show progress on certain milestones so in your consumer discovery phase we need to understand customer problem size of the pain uh, you have a clear identified uh, customer profile. Um, and behind that, you have click-through rates, conversion rates, and all different types of metrics, right, that you can can uh, can measure. Then you move forward. Then you need to start testing lo-fi MVPs. Can we find early adopters? How fast can we recruit them? Uh, did we test the price point? So you need to have, on, on let's say, if you want to manage the stakeholders and the interface between team and stakeholder, you want to have an investment maturity level into an end-to-end -end process so that you can align on, well, in this phase, 
the first three, four months, the team needs to prove X, Y, Z. And we know that it's successful in this industry if we hit certain benchmarks, the size of the market, etc. If not, we stop. And that is, and that is even the, the hardest part um, because what we want to avoid is uh, zombie projects. Yeah, So projects that continuously go on, they suck resources and time, and, and there's not really traction because it's too difficult after two years to pull the plug. But it's easy to pull the plug after three months and a small investment. It's difficult after two years and 20 million of investment, right? So I think the beauty of the process is that you stop things early because I've done quite some portfolio analysis during uh, my years. And what is very interesting is that one moment in time, I saw a, a pipeline of a company and a lot of projects continued to the MVP phase. And so launching an MVP, uh, going into a pilot phase, and then nothing was scaled, maybe one, which was an acquisition, right? So um, we need to be very, I think, very clear that if the, tom, the team can't, prove significant traction in the first four months on a couple of key drivers, then or we give the team two, three weeks to go a bit into a direction, find more relevant day, or it stops. That's that simple. Or it stops. And then the team did not fail, which is very tough sometimes. No, the team figured out that there is no opportunity. Now let's replace the team on something else in our portfolio where we might think that there's an opportunity, right? So it's a very different way of, of at least, I think it's a very different way of operating. Yeah, it's a very different way of thinking. It's more about, okay, you have this team as a resource. Okay, let's allocate them four months on project A. If they've, if they've, if they've deemed in a structured way that there is no opportunity, let's move them to project B. Rather than saying, okay, this this team fail, let's, let's can them and get another set of people for project b i think to me it's always like when we discuss this internally it's like okay what's the learnings we've had from project a if it failed it failed let's move on it's, there's no more and, and for a lot of people that's like a challenge because it's like hey i spent four months on this i spent so many hours building this thing and like it's like hey like there's no opportunity you got, like let's salvage what we can and let's like iterate right and Next for a lot minute. of people like, i think for you that you said it's the mindset of like yeah i, I can actually yes give up on it. Sorry, I interrupted uh, Tatiana. No, no, no. Actually, I think it's a good ad. And, and, and what I want to say is that um, um, yeah, the, the goal is not to fail. Eh? So there's always this fall, fail fast, etc. And, and, and I'm not, not so much a fan of all these mantras um, because we want to succeed. But in order to succeed, probably we fail a lot, right? Because it's yeah, super right, difficult. Yeah. It's super difficult for a large company to prove a big enough size of the venture that it can be not dilutive to the PL, which is another problem. So it needs to be separated, right? So, um, now, except, so I mean, it's just a complex thing. And most things fail, but do it fast, yeah? Do it rigorous, and then allocate your team to things that, because there are, and then we are also talking from that experience, things can also succeed, right? So. Um, but it's just, um, yeah, it's just a different way of operating it. And yeah, you navigate through high uncertainty. So, and then even for a corporation, you need to produce big numbers to, to make yeah. management uh, vested. Right. So I think that's an inter I, have, I haven't heard someone think like, it's an interesting way of looking at it. It's like, Hey, this could be a success and it could be a success, but it could not be, uh, big enough for a large corporation. They need this to be a 10 million and dollar initiative it, yeah. if it generates a million it's just not enough like it could be yeah. a good small business but yeah. I, I, I didn't really think about that there could yeah, be a whole great graveyard of opportunities if, if you want to right. show the value um uh, and you have a 50 billion euro company well you can calculate what type of numbers you need to produce and that is something you want to understand upfront. so how far can we dilute from that how far can we move away from that or not because otherwise you have teams that only focus on desirability, then they, then they create MVPs that the consumer wants, but it can never, never uh, become viable in the way a corporation it expects. And that's what you want to have in your first three months to, to really understand your key risky viability assumptions, which is for a corporation and also for a startup uh, very important. But indeed, if you and I would build a 2 million euro business, nah, not bad, right? Uh, but yeah, in a corporation, who who cares, really? 
two million. I don't even come out of my bed for two million. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it is like that. Huh? It is, it is. And it is also from a business model perspective, it's dilutive. So they, they cannot, as responsible business, they cannot allow that to happen. So uh, it's always going to be challenged either from a size or a profit point of view. But you got to show them some real juicy numbers uh, that, that uh, take into account the, the, the current today, like the, the initial point and the future, so that they can make sense of it, minimum uh, yeah. sense. And therefore, I think that's my last add to this thing, is that you really need to understand with your stakeholders and team what is the goal of our venture building? How far can we... Is it to improve the core business? Great. Can we need to do an adjacent innovation? If it's like Horizon 3, new business models, transformation, well, you better align 14 times uh, you know, to, uh, to be sure that um, we are all on the same page and that in the case of real venture building and, and transformation type of innovations, uh, you need to have patience for growth. Because yeah, you don't, because you're not ready to invest on a five to seven years time horizon. Forget about it. You don't have to do it, which I don't judge. But yeah, then then put your money somewhere else, right? So I just think it's my, my biggest takeaway from this is like you need to think like it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you need to think like that unicorn type of founder where it's like you need to go in and like you, you're essentially launching a very large venture, whether you like it or not. You can't just go and launch a million or two million dollar venture. You have to think like somebody who can go and be like, hey, this this needs to generate an X amount of millions and stuff. So that's something I just never, never thought about. Um, and, and probably it makes you passionate for the right thing, which is uh, delighting uh, consumers, really breaking through to them. Um, and not simply be attached to your piece of technology or your conception of what a good idea would be. Just like, if it's really good, it's going to be big. And, and, and it's difficult to combine desirability with feasibility and viability at yeah. scale. It's damn hard. It, it's a much narrower space. But that's the space of success. Anyone can do a successful one to two million company. But... Working with large corporations require a bit more than that. <laughs> just a bit. Just, <laughs> just a bit. Don't forget. Don't forget. 200 million. That's it. <laughs> yeah, just that's it. It's a, it's a no-brainer. All right, let me get, get this question by Paulo up because I think it's um, it's in, in, in line with what we were just talking about. But, like, you know, what are the, some of the strategies you would use to recruit, like, a vision-aligned team at an early stage? Um I guess this is at the corporate level. Like if you're, if I'm looking at, well, even on the agency level, if I'm looking to build a team out in this space of corporate innovation and venture building, like how do you ensure alignment, at least on the, on the delivery team, not necessarily just on the, on the client side, if that makes sense. I'll give the client perspective and Misha will give his perspective from someone who saw a lot of teams being put together for, for good and for bad um, internally. Um, so you need I, entrepreneurs. I, I, I think we should, uh, the good and the bad. I'm curious to know what, what you mean by that. <laughs> the good and the bad. So um, you need entrepreneurs. That's what you need, which is by definition not a classic executive profile, classic corporate profile. Uh, corporate profiles are risk avoidant. They are very good at repeating themselves and improving at each round. So they are maximizers, optimizers. Uh, they are on maintenance, and they actually are the ones who make the world go round. Uh, things exist and get maintained and supported because of these people, so there's nothing wrong about them. But it's a different profile, clearly, from uh, um, an entrepreneur or an innovator. These guys are more naturally um, um, inclined to risk-taking. They are a bit restless. They, they don't take uh, uh, simple no's. As, as answers, they, they want to know why and why and why. They are a pain in the ass. They are they, they bug you. Um, they are resilient. They, they, they find different ways. It's not your traditional profile uh, for, for a corporation. So um, the way to be successful there with recruitment for these initiatives is to find these guys. They, they exist. They are not the majority, again, but they exist. And if you offer them a chance to learn a whole 
different way to operate with more freedom, with faster cycles, they're going to be delighted and, and, and the likelihood of them uh, really, really embracing it and delivering uh, very fast is great. The problem starts, and this is the, 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 the ugly, uh, when uh, the profile is not really taken into consideration, when it's more uh, um, um, a matching of people who are kind of um, available. available at that point, of people that wouldn't be a big miss to the everyday journey of the business, then put this, this person there to, to, to really make sure we are, we are uh, building um, some, some volume to the new culture. Uh, this is the wrong thing to do because if, if you put a, a risk averse, super controlling, highly analytical, um, individualistic profile in working like this, um, you're probably going to break the person. It's going to burn out. It's gonna, not going to feel comfortable at all. And as Misha said, in the end of the cycle, might have difficulties finding a place to go back to the mothership. So I've seen both happening, and I seriously advise for the first. It's like, do your thing, select the people with the mindset, with the appetite uh, to join, and you're not going to regret it. Yeah, and I think there are two more things uh, adding from my side. One is there... So I know a lot of founders, um, right? And uh, I've been in that role also many times. Uh, and I always had a strong vision of what should happen, right? So I had the slides, this is how it should be, etc. And I was trying to persuade other people that that is the best thing. And sometimes you succeed in that, right? If you're a good influencer, etc. cetera. Um, but I think the most important thing is that leave the vision, your vision for a moment in the fridge and start uh, because you want the other side of the table becoming vested in your plan. So how can you, so they need to come up that your idea is actually a good idea, right? And you don't do that by sort of presenting slides and, and then ask, oh, do you get it? Do you understand it? Yes, we're on the same page. Fantastic, we go. So that's not how it works. So can we hold a moment our own vision in the fridge and we talk about the topic and let they come with a vision? I think that's one. And two, the best thing where you want to also recruit for is can, do you still like each other when shit happens, right? Because we all like each other uh, when things are going well, but if you don't have the, the routines in place or the open personality or the, uh, or, the, or the trust in your team, so you also need to be able to manage distrust, right? Which always happens in every team, distrust, et cetera. Uh, that is something which is under the table, which is not always talked about. And then you go to the mediator, it's too late, then you have lawyers and then there's no venture, right? So um, recruit also um, for people um, that, have, that have been in that situation before and sort of learned from that because that's your best indicator, you know, that, that you can stick that team together. I hope that helps. No, I think, yeah, this has been great. Like. We just have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure we have some time to do some networking as well. But like, honestly, I could probably go for like two days just asking you all a lot of questions. Uh, folks, if you've enjoyed Misha and Tatiana, there's like an emoji button. Please show us some love. Uh, yeah, okay, we got a couple claps in there. Uh, okay, good. So uh, yeah, this is awesome. I think a lot of interesting insights here that, from the two of you. We didn't get through any of the, like all the questions I wanted, but you know, we had a chance to engage the audience and get to listen more about them um you know one thing i do want to mention uh, before we go into like our final remarks and networking is that uh you know misha is going to be running a boot camp uh i think it's in august or so uh, sorry in july i'm going to throw the link up there it's on corporate venture building it's all this type of stuff he's going to dive deeper into it so if you're interested go check it out he does a pretty good job of laying out everything you need uh, we'll send out the link also in the email for everyone that's recording, uh, that's watching this later. Um, just to wrap up here, I think what I usually like, like, like to do uh, is that, you know, I'll switch the view so everyone can kind of see you all next to each other. But like any final parting wisdom for like, you you know, we, we had 200 people, I think about 80, 90 people were live at once. We have, still have about 50 people live. Uh, you know, this recording will go out, but like what are some parting wisdom for uh, the audience, like corporate innovation is such a new space. Um, like a lot of people are going to make mistakes. A lot of people are going to have some success, but 
you, you know, you, you folks have been in this space for quite some time. Uh, what is like looking, if you want to say like looking back, what would your advice be to either somebody who's starting out in their corporate innovation role or looking to, or just getting started? Uh, like how should they prepare themselves yeah. for that role? Right? A lot of things mentioned, right? But what stood out for me is that the, um, the magic is not in the process, eh? but it's in the people. Yeah? So invest in your people, recruit the right people, uh, give time for them to get the drill. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important things because the process will kill creativity, right? Um, so that is, I think, an important one to stay conscious about. And if you do it, go all in. Yeah, Don't do it half, but then do it well. And like the Jana said, align, you know, what is it that we need to achieve? When is it successful, et cetera? But that's from my side. Perfect. From Thanks, my side. Yeah, Tatiana, go ahead. Sorry. From my side, thinking about um, if you have uh, a choice of what to work with, if you believe you can do many other things or a couple of other things, do the other things. Because there is probably nothing harder than doing uh, corporate innovation for large organizations. So if it's not something that comes from your heart, for, for which you're fully, fully passionate, to the point of not seeing yourself doing anything else, then uh, don't do it. You, you just go for it. If It's almost a curse. You, you cannot let go of it. That's who you are. That defines you. And finally, building a bit on what Misha said, it's going to push your limits. So um, go for some self-development. Do some self-search. Do therapy. It's like know your shadows. Know your, 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 your ghosts, your, your, your dragons. Um, because they're going to come after you and, and you should rather know them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. There's so much. I wish we could just like have a podcast that this is just going to go on for hours. But definitely need to get the two of you back on to, to chat more. We have like a library of questions here. Um, uh, Misha, Tatiana, thank you so much. I think this has been super enjoyable. One of my favorite panelists uh, I've, I've hosted uh, to, 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 to date. Um, but everyone else from joining in, uh, thank you so much for taking the time or if you're a busy day. We're going to end now. We'll break out to networking. Feel free to talk to each other. We still have about 50 plus people here. So, all right. We'll wrap up here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tatiana. Thanks, Misha. Thanks, man. Thank you. Take care.